and uh, remind you that there's a shine up sign up sheet over there. If you'd like to bring goodies in the future, put your name down and we'll contact you. Uh, and also too, I'm not sure if I did this last time or maybe Thomas did at the last uh, meeting. I'd like to recognize uh, Sylvia Andrews, who um, who is our new PAHS, our uh, PAHS uh, representative on the uh, state level CAS uh, Education Committee. I'd like to thank Sylvia. And it's uh, uh, volunteers that make uh, PAHS a success. Uh, I'd like to make a few announcements uh, about future events, and then we'll get to our guest speaker. Saturday, April 22nd, Thomas Elliott, our vice president, will be leading a PAHS hidden library tour. Put this date on your calendar for this one day special tour that will acquaint you with the resources that are hidden in plain sight, uh, but available to everyone. The tour will visit the special co collections in the Rawlings Library, uh, photos and historical documents of the Pueblo County Historical Society upstairs, uh, the life cycle of the steel mill, mines, and business operations in the CFNI Steelworks Archives and also the PCC Library. If you're interested in that, uh, you can uh, contact uh, Thomas or Thomas right there. Let him know that you're interested in that field trip. And I think there's still a few openings. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Saturday, April 29th, 1 p.m. is the CAS orderly meeting right here in the Pueblo Heritage Museum. PHAS welcomes representatives of the Colorado Archaeological Society to Pueblo for the CAS or the Colorado Archaeological Society quarterly meeting. PAHS members are automatically members of CAS and are welcome to attend. Quarterly meetings of the society are held at various locations across the state uh, to ensure all, that all chapters and interested members of the society have an opportunity to meet in person. At these meetings, the current uh, state of the society is reviewed and reports from various chapters are heard as well as uh, represented. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, all are welcome to attend. You don't, uh, if you're a, a PAHS member, you can come to the CAS meeting and see what's going on at the state level. May is Archaeology and Historic Preservation Month. And to help celebrate, uh, at our next meeting on Thursday, May 4th, our featured speaker will be state historian, Dr. Jared, Jared Orsi, author of the new book, Citizen Explore, The Life of Zebulon Pike. In Citizen Explorer, historian Jared Orsi uh, provides the first modern biography of this soldier, Pike, uh, and Explorer, who rivaled contemporaries Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. Uh, born in 1779, Pike joined the Army and served in frontier posts in the Ohio River Valley before embarking on a series of astonishing uh, expeditions. He sought the headwaters of the Mississippi and later sources of the Arkansas and Red Rivers, which led him to what is now Colorado and Pikes Peak, although he called it James Peak. A stay here in Pueblo, uh, and also he stayed here in Pueblo and was later captured by Spanish forces in the San Luis Valley. Next month's meeting, and uh, remember this, will be at the Rawlings Library, not here at the Heritage Museum. Uh, it would be on the fourth floor in the uh, uh, Riles room. Um, and also, we are planning other activities in, uh, in honor of Archaeological and Historic Pre Preservation Month. And so watch your emails, and those uh, will be announcing the events that we have coming up. Also in honor of Historical and or Archaeology and Historical Preservation Month, our book discussion group will be reading Dr. Orsi's book, Citizen Explorer, The Life of Zebulon Pike. Uh, and you have plenty of time to read it. Uh, the date will be, oh, I didn't put the date on here. Catherine, what was the date? Thank you. May 22nd, 
uh, which is a Monday. So you have plenty of time to get the book. I'm just about finished it and it is really interesting and it gives you a different perspective on Pike and kind of the, the history and the intrigue uh, of politics and the intrigue that was going on at the time of uh, Pike's ex expedition. Um, let's see, okay, that's it. I'd li like to now introduce Spencer Little. Spencer is the past. <laughs> Spencer is the past vice president of PAHS and has recently been actively involved in field work while pursuing his master's degree in archaeology at Colorado State University, Fort Collins. Spencer is a sixth generation resident of the Arkansas Valley, grew up in Wetmore, uh, where his father taught him the value of ancestral histori and historical perspective perspectives. Now Spencer is applying these lessons and pursuing an MA in archaeology from Colorado State University, Fort Collins. Before making this move, Spencer worked as the director of the Pueblo Heritage Museum. He uh, is involved in professional archaeological research across the state, including Fremont Pinnacle Research in Rio Blanco County, reanalysis of legacy collections excavated by C, uh, Colorado University and Colorado State University, and fieldwork documenting the cultural resources at multiple public lands within Larimer County. Additionally, Spencer is involved in volunteer and personal pet projects, uh, including rock art documentation in Southeast uh, Colorado with PHAS, historical archeology span on the Overland Trail with the Northern Colorado chapter of uh, uh, CAS and uh, has a persistent interest uh, in research into passive hunting technology uh, and snares, meaning snares and traps which is really interesting. You should talk to him about that sometime. Uh, and also Southern Plains Village Cultures. Beyond archeology, span Spencer has an interest in art, poetry, dreaming, string figures and magic. And we're hoping maybe he has a magic trip after his talk. <laughs> is that right, Spencer? <laughs> okay, a poem works too. Welcome Spencer Little. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm so tickled. Everybody being here. My audio is coming through, I guess. Yes. OK. Um, yeah, like I was just uh, telling Doug, I, I mean, I am going to get into all my thesis research here. But since I have a captive audience uh, and you guys are kind of going to be sitting here with me, regardless of what I say, I'm going to start with a poem. Uh, this is a poem by John Nisley, who's a really good friend of mine up in Fort Collins. Uh, some of the themes and the ideas, you know, they touch on the way I think of the world and I think of the archaeological record and the way the environment has such great agency and how really there's only the present moment, even though we're so interested in the past, right? Um, so you'll catch some of that, but I'll let the poem speak for itself and then we'll get into the weeds here. Okay. Uh, this poem is called Convalescence by John Nisley. Deep breath. Carry your empty bucket to the well. Maybe there is a way of rooting the self in light again, of lowering the rope slowly, of hearing the splash echo off stone, of feeling the weight of the evening sun running through water filling to the brim, Look at your past faces and all their weariness reflected here. The selves you were always pained to see erasing into ripples, then into nothing. You are of the present now. Where to pull the rope down is to pull the sun up. Where to set the bucket on the ground is to remember how to grow grace from seed. Soon you will learn to ask the water's permission to drink the grass to rest your feet, the sky to open into the well where like intensive, cloudlessly and tirelessly green. Oh, thank you, everybody. I feel much more centered after that. Okay, now we'll get into the archaeology stuff. So 
I'm going to be talking about my thesis research, which has um, been focused on reanalyzing the Hell's Midden collection. This is a site in northwestern Colorado that was uh, dug by the University of Colorado in the 1940s. And so for the last year and a half or so, I've been working with the collections, working with the archives um, at this site. This is a photo of one portion of the site. You can see it's this large mound. We'll have some more photos. Um, but yeah, that's just the first one that we have there. So here is basically the outline of my presentation. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the history of investigations. I previously gave a talk to the Boulder chapter of CAS, which focused exclusively on the history, but I'm going to try to go through it a little more quickly this time, and then talk about the questions that I had reanalyzing this for my thesis, which are, how old is the site? It's this really deep sequence of occupational history there, um, but it hasn't been dated. So that was one of the main goals of my uh, research here was getting absolute dates from the site, radiocarbon dates. And then I was really interested because the top parts of the site have Fremont agriculturalist occupations, right? It came in about a thousand AD, give or take a couple hundred years. The underlying sequence is all this hunter gatherer archaic stuff. My questions is kind of related to, you know, we have this idea of the Neolithic revolution that farming takes off and all of a sudden people get really interested in living in square shaped villages and making pottery and all of this stuff and staying year round at places. But I was curious, do we have evidence here in those pre-agricultural horizons of kind of similar settlement strategies of revisiting the same place year after year for seasonal resource procurement or that? So um, yeah, we'll get into all of those topics. I have another blank slide just for us to all take a deep breath together again. Okay, <laughs> so um, Hell's Midden, I need to point with this laser, I guess. You can see right here, everybody see my laser there and at home, I'm hoping. Hell's Midden is located at the mouth of Hell's Canyon, which is one of two access points, the other being Red Rock Canyon, to this area called Castle Park. You can see in this cutaway, this is located within Dinosaur National Monument on the Yampa River, far northwestern Colorado. This is in Moffat County. Uh, the nearest town would be like Maybell or Craig. Um, but Castle Park is this real low-lying area with uh, just really lush soils compared to the rest of the surrounding environment. It has high temperatures. It's a really suitable place to be uh, settling in, whether you're a a human or a wild carrot or a deer. It's just a really favorable condition compared to the rest of this canyon country. I see I have a basic timeline along the edge. Um, interest in this part of the state really started with uh, Mantle's Cave, which I'll show some artifacts here in a moment. But um, the Jones Lee were a couple of um, uh, artifact collectors who lived in Boulder. And in 1939, they dug out a cache from this Mantle's Cave site that contained fish hooks, snares, um, all of this stuff contained in a beautiful basket um, inside of a stone lined pit. They donated this cache to Earl Morris, who was at um, the University of Colorado. Uh, C C U M N H. Uh, I just got some echo here. Something changed with the audio. Okay, anyhow. Sorry, Sorry. Gang. <laughs> uh, CUMNH is the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History. So these artifacts were brought there in 1939. Within a couple of months, um, museum staff went out to the Mantles Ranch that had a lot of this Castle Park area to inquire about doing uh, some archaeological investigation. So in November of 39, the next month in December, two students. Uh, uh, Chili Scoggin and Edison Lohr were sent out to Castle Park for six months and they recorded sites um, across this Castle Park region. And you can see 16 of their sites that they recorded on this map here, Hell's Midden being one of them. Um, Berg revisited in 47, and then two field schools returned in 1948 and 49, 49 which is where the majority of our uh, data comes from. Yes. yes. And it's, and it's hard, hard for me to speak because it's delayed, delayed somewhat. I'm sorry if I'm sounding. <laughs> I'm trying to push through here. Okay. okay. So, so here's the site. You can see Edison Lore. You'll see this figure here standing with a 10-foot stadia rod there. This 
mound feature is the site. Hell's Mid. Um, this is where the main area of excavation was focused. Uh, there's a ditch running along the base of this mound, which was built about 1908. Um, and even though they're looking for these incredible perishable cave sites, uh, which I'll show examples of, Hell's Mitten was recognized on the first day of them being there. And you can see this note. He was talking just before in his feet um, that, uh, here, I got this. <laughs> he was talking to his field generals. Oh, the Mammals family has been so, um, hospitable to us and this evening we were noodling around and man we found all these artifacts coming out of this site unfortunately the site's not a midden as we'll get to but we're stuck with the name because that's what the first ex excavators thought they hypothesized there was a village up on top of this ledge and that all their refuse formed this midden um there was actually a primary uh, occupation surface which we'll get into but this quote i mean this just gave me chills that this is a treasure chest to be sure. This was a good nod for me to press on with my research. So in that first 1940s session, um, they dug kind of on the far upstream edge of the midden. Basically behind this tree here is where uh, Scoggin and Lore focused their units. They have no vertical control. They kind of went in from the ditch you can see and just cut into that wall. But you can see some pretty well-defined strats uh, on this back, uh, just behind Ed Lohr there, showing that the site has, you know, some integrity that could show this sequence of occupation uh, along the Yampa River. Trouble was, we didn't know for how long that had lasted. But so here's 1940. Yeah, still got the echo. Um, so there's a before and after photo. Here in 1947, um, what, what happened, uh, Chili Scoggin went to the war and he was killed in World War II. So research wasn't able to continue and he wasn't able to report on all of his work there. And the Park Service, the recently expanded Dinosaur National Monument was really pressuring the museum. Hey, you gotta get a report out. I know you wanna come out here and dig some more, but tell us what did you do for six months over 1940? So Robert Berg, who was the assistant to the director, he's standing right here. He thought, well, I need to go test these deposits myself. So rather than digging here, he went up to the height, the crest of the midden, which is behind where he's standing in this photo. He identified all of these cultural strats, basically continuous sequence of occupation. Uh, best he could tell. That fixed it. Best he could tell. Here's some photos. He writes in his journal, oh, man, I had to clean up in the rain, and I ran out to take these photos, so they're not great quality. Um, but that's the kind of trench he dug, ultimately to a depth of 10 feet. Um, and he was within this tiny little telephone box at the bottom. You see why he quit. <laughs> but in 1948, that was the big year. Uh, CU returned as a field school under Robert Lister, who is here. This is Berg's Trench from 1947. They expanded this to be two meters across, ultimately 10 meters north to south, cutting across the entire extent of the midden and exposing this large profile, um, which we will show in just a moment. 1949, uh, Field School returned, and you can see how they put their units adjacent to that, or perpendicular, rather, to that 1948 trench. And they were digging against the shelter wall, which you can see at the left of these couple of photos. And they moved a lot of dirt. So here's kind of how all those units line up uh, roughly together. This is the extent of the midden as recorded in 1940. That's where uh, that first excavation was. This is Berg's little test trench. Great big trench dug in 48 and then the 49 uh, field school. You can see the amount of material that they excavated from this site is pretty astounding. Um, these chipstone artifacts are almost all tools they excavated another 10,000 uh, flakes or bits of debitage from the site, but those weren't collected ultimately. So we're left with about 900 stone tools and 1,100 other little pieces. Uh, 3,000.
screen. Okay, beautiful. Um, yeah, in addition, a lot of bone artifacts, so fair preservation for a more or less exposed site, uh, lots of awls, uh, uh, dice for playing some kind of gambling game, you know, snare slides, all this. Uh, a lot of groundstone artifacts, including a really cool pipe that uh, Chile and uh, Edison lore uh, dug out in the 40s. Lots of features, and we'll get to all that stuff. But overall, four and a half meters of cultural deposits at this site, very well stratified and basically continuous. And like I say here, all this area of the site potentially remains. I've never visited this site. This trench was never backfilled, so God knows what happened to it since then. Uh, but in theory, there's this much more of the site that could be explored in the future. Oh, now my clicker. Mm. Yeah, what did I do? I unmuted myself. Why did he do that? <laughs> Fingers. Yeah, it won't let me out of this window to hit. Do this. Yeah, maybe if I click. Oh, it's touch screen. Oh, okay, good enough. All right. It's new stuff. Yeah. Right. So um, here's that beautiful profile that was exposed from that large uh, north-south trench dug in 1948. As you can see along, the, particularly on the back wall, under the shelter, the, the drip line of that, you know, some relatively shallow shelter is right here about in uh, section C. And you can see behind that, you have all of these fire features, uh, potential storage pits, hard packed living surfaces down to a depth of about uh, two and a half meters here. This level here with charcoal and ash is the lowest at four and a half meters. Um, that has evidence of occupation. And below that, it's really just all churned up river stuff. But this is basically the surface of the river plain that just surrounds that whole area. So most of this was built up by human occupation at the site, which is um, pretty incredible. This is the way that uh, Bob Lister, who wrote a report on the site in 1951, this is how he broke it up. He considered the top uh, two meters or so to be the horticultural stage. This is what we would now identify, and they identified with Fremont occupation in this region. So these were agriculturalist Native American groups living there. Um, huge uh, explosion in the density of the materials for those upper levels. But that's basically these features that you see here were the beginning of that occupation. Um, of that agriculturalist occupation. I'll refer to that as upper. And then for the lower, it's what he called this hunting gathering stage. And you have um, market drop in density of the cultural materials um, and a change, right? No more uh, arrow points and things like that. You get more of these big dart points and spear points, um, but some ground stones, some caches, some really interesting stuff um, that we'll get to. So my next few slides will describe these deposits but first, if you let me indulge, oh, that cut off. Oh, well, if you let me indulge in some archaeo poetics, this artifact to me speaks to the entire site. This site is showing this record of continued reoccupation, right? And this artifact is far out, if you'll stick with me for just a minute. So this is a pumpkin shirt. And when the pumpkin shirt gets exposed to, you know, certain environmental uh, conditions, it gets this red patina on it. Okay, so when you first break the rock, you get this nice orange color, and that lasts until this red patina kind of shows up. What we have here is an artifact that right here, you can see this core. So that was busted off a piece of pumpkin shirt, God knows how long ago, right? That tool was then used, and somebody chucked it over their shoulder, oh, I'm done using that. A long time later, long enough for this patina to form, someone else picked it up, and they resharpened it, and we have all these thinning flakes on its opposite edge. Then they used that edge once again, and then they chucked it over their shoulder, and it landed at the Hell's Midden site. And four and a half meters of sediment filled in on top of this thing. So this artifact, if everybody's tracking, shows a very ancient sequence of use just in its form alone. But then it was found four and a half meters at the bottom of this thing. So as I say, this artifact is as old as the dirt which formed this site. I think that is way cool. 
this, I think it is way cool. This is the deepest uh, unequivocal artifact from the site for sure. There's some stone balls and stuff that other people said, I don't really buy it, but that's why I'm reanalyzing, I guess. Oh, more of it got cut off. I, I built this thing in PowerPoint 2010 and now I'm on a new computer. <laughs> so, uh, um, so this is the longest sequence, as you can see about uh, two meters to three and a half meters below the surface of really well-defined strats. There's some more ephemeral stuff below that. But the point types we see are uh, Mallory points up here is a well-known plains type. Pinto points, which are spread out all across the Great Basin and basically all the way through time. And then these more Elko points. Trouble with this, as you all know, artifacts, a lot of times projectile points can be kind of index fossils. And we can guess how old the site is just by the style. In the Great Basin, it is so messy. And particularly here in the Northern Colorado Plateau, you have this kind of uh, convergence. It's the intersection between the Northwest Plains and the Great Basin. And so you have these two different series of point typologies that make it really, really difficult to get any kind of temporal diagnostic um, off of these artifacts, which is why dating is so important. This lower sequence though also has living floors. You can see here a plan view of one of those living floors and caches. Here's a cache of five ground stones, all shaped into that kind of classic loaf shape. And this probably speaks to, you know, seasonal processing of plant foods at this site. I'm gonna talk a lot about the caches in my conclusion here. So just keep that in mind that people are storing stuff here so they can come back and use it in the future. Now the upper sequence, what we now call the, you know, the Fremont occupation of the site, we have pottery. You can see here a big busted vessel. That was um, the most shallow uh, or the most recent evidence of Fremont occupation. It was found directly associated with some corn that I was able to date in this project. More caches of just kind of balls, not even artifacts or bifaces, just a nice tool stone that would be there for whoever wanted to turn that into an artifact later. You can say all these bone tools, little tiny pieces of very finely made textiles. I mean, really finely uh, twill weave, I think. I'm not a textile person, I don't know. Um, but this pipe, and then you see this pipe fragment, that thing is so cool. Um, other stuff, uh, this upper sequence really well relates to other sites in Castle Park. A lot of those caves um, were very famous for the perishable artifacts. I would argue this flicker feather headdress is one of the most famous artifacts found in our state, um, just because it's so beautifully preserved. You have the feathers from about 70 flicker feathers at minimum uh, used to build this. You have the orange flicker feathers on the one side, yellow on the middle. Some people have made a big deal about this being a plains variant of the flicker and a Great Basin variant. Um, and then this ermine feather thing. This has been dated multiple times, lands right about to 950 AD thereabout. Meanwhile, it was cached directly with this doe skin headdress in these clearly Fremont made caches. I mean, the, the, the way the stone line pits are made, the way other artifacts associated with that were dated, it shows Fremont. This thing's 2000 years older. This dates to about 3000 uh, years ago, which is weird. What does that mean? I, some people say, oh, well, it was like a museum or something. I don't know. I think the Fremont folks were probably going to caves in this area. If stuff is well preserved for archaeologists to discover today, surely it was then too. You know, so they've probably found this in some other cave. And thought, Man, that's really cool. I'm going to take that home and add that to my ritual paraphernalia. Other things you see are granaries, which is really diagnostic of these Uinta Fremont, where they're storing food, mostly to keep away, it seems like, from other humans more than uh, rats and things like that. But that was probably a piece of it. And then these kind of dumbbell looking corn cobs. Nobody knows what those are about, but find those all over the place, too. My question here that got cut off, why do we have all this Fremont in the caves, but you don't have any of that hunter-gatherer stuff that's uh, shown in the lower sequence at Hell's Midden? I'm going to get into that. I have an idea. Probably wrong, but I have an idea. <laughs> and then the final upper level, about four centimeters below the surface, is the Pat Lynch horizon, the Hermit of Pat's Hole. 
And you can see his quote up here, if in those caverns you shelter take, please do to them no harm. Leave everything you find around hanging up or on the ground. Uh, he'd written that inside one of his caves to say, hey, you know, I'm living here. I'm planning to return. Like, don't mess with my canteen or my bullets, please. Um, and Pat Lynch, we know he was around because here's a P. It's hard to make out. But he would carve this monogram all over rock art sites in the region. He was also a whaler uh, and worked in the U.S. Navy, and he'd carve these ship glyphs right over big Fremont rock art sites. Um, so he's obviously there. You can see that Pat Lynch level just real discreet right up top here. So there's, uh, yeah, that's the upper sequence basically. Lower sequence down to here is really well stratified. Uh, below that, uh, you still have it, but it's a little more ephemeral. So now we're getting to my research questions. How old are the deposits at this site, right? And how sedentary were these occupants through time? So on the how old is the site, you know, we want proof that these dates are that it's contemporary to the other cave sites and these other uh, Mantles Cave and Marigold's Cave and these other places that have been very well dated. This region is just totally uh, overrepresented, maybe not overrepresented, it's probably true, but the radiocarbon dates from that area are overwhelmingly Fremont. I mean, they just left such a mark on that place, and that's where a lot of people's research focus has been. So we have a ton of Fremont dates from Castle Park. None until this work of those earlier occupations, right? The other question with that, you have about two meters, a meter and a half of Fremont occupation at the top part of the site. How much time was that? Was that Fremont and other places, uh, the overall range is maybe 200 AD to 12, 1300, something like that. Could this be a whole thousand year span or is their use of Castle Park much more discreet in time? Other sites there seem to say it is. Uh, does Hell's Midden bear that out? And then are these deposits really continuous? Can we see the transition, right? That neolithization moment. Can you see when these corn farmers move in and change the life ways there? Or is there going to be some gap that'll fiddle with us? Yes, there's a gap that fiddles with us. <laughs> um, and then how sedentary were they through time? Um, did the Fremont make this great just switch over to sedentism and intensive use of these sites. And before that, it was just all these wandering groups. Or was there was that kind of the pattern of use at Castle Park through time? So starting with number one, um, I got uh, selected radiocarbon samples from the assemblage. Um, we got three corn dates from the site, all at different levels within that upper uh, Fremont horizon. 10 bone samples up to a depth of uh, three and a half meters from the site. So we get some pretty resolute, uh, more resolute than anything before, you know, dates for this site. Those were sent off to uh, University of Georgia for data, for getting dating. And uh, then we ran some basic stats on them. Um, and we'll get into that now. So here's the results of my dates. Uh, you can see this is the upper portion. So we have a kind of early date, about 500 AD, but these other ones cluster pretty well between 800 and 11, 1200 AD. So that looks pretty good. That is kind of to be expected with the other Castle Park dates, right? But in the lower, we have a big gap. So this is 500 AD or so, and then we don't pick it back up until about, 900 BC. So we have a large gap of, you know, 1500 years or so between these two things. So what's going on there, right? My thought is that that Fremont occupation at this site was so intensive that they may have just erased those, what were at the time, those topmost levels, right? That period dating after 1000 BC, there were probably artifacts and all kinds of things, but they were digging features, digging fire pits, picking up artifacts from the site. You know, I only have so many dates, so more dates could help see if there really is that gap, but uh, it seems like that's the case. But overall, the site shows us 4,500 years of occupation between about 3,700 BC and uh, 11, 1200 there. So just to put that back into there, 
So yeah, this lower level here, right about 3700 BC, this top contact surface right here, about uh, 700 BC or that, and then a big gap, 700 BC to 600 AD, we have a break in the stratigraphy right at these features. So like I say, more dates could help us figure that out, but darn, because that's the thing you want to see. What, how did the Fremont people moving in, how did that work? Was that a new group moving in? Was that the hunter-gatherers living there who just adopted corn technology? It's really, that's the part you want to see, but it's uh, just elusive across the archeological record. Okay, the next question is, um, how sedentary were these folks through time? So what I did for this was I selected several variables. You can see them listed on the side. I won't go into all of those, but um, I quantified all of these things so that I could try to make them directly comparable. Um, because each year we had those four excavation seasons, each one used different um, level designations. So it really got hairy. So I had to compare uh, the two field school seasons separately. Um, but basically we lined those all up, percent ranked them on Excel, which you can see here, and I'll have a much better graphic next. Don't bother yourself trying to read this. Um, but yeah, this, this question that Berg and Scoggin wrote in their 1948 report that without an understanding of the circumstance of residence, you know, our knowledge of Hell's Midden cannot be complete. So that's what I was trying to get at here. So those are those same values I just took. I took a percentile rank for each of these variables and then made a mean rank here on the end. This is the level designations used in 49 and 48 following that scheme. Green means high sedentism. Red means a lot less, okay? Yellow somewhere in the middle. What you can see here is, yes, this upper horizon, Fremont, very highly ranked. It makes sense. I mean, it's just incredibly dense deposits to be expected. Here in 1948, remember, that's the trench that went straight through the midden. We don't have very good evidence in these layers. But in 1949, back up against the shelter wall, we do. What is that suggesting? Well, that suggests that archaeologists really aren't uh, paleocultural anthropologists. The environment is fighting us. The environment is taking these sites and jumbling it all up and making it much harder to interpret some of this stuff. Right, So we have good evidence for sedentism beneath the shelter, but out here where it was more exposed, a lot of that stuff is washed away. So this is just kind of humbling, I think, for me to think, man, if all I had was this 48 excavation season and I did the same thing, my results would be totally different. Right. So um, the environment is acting on this stuff as much as humans are. But what we see, I mean, this record of sedentism really fits the regional record. Um, historically, we have accounts of Shoshone people using the Yampa River to seasonally extract uh, wild carrot. The name Yampa actually comes from the Shoshonean word for wild carrot. Um, and Fremont described those folks doing that along the river. The archaeological record shows this as well. The Middle Archaic, you see a big explosion in residential architecture, all of these kind of more uh, solid markers for sedentary lifeways, right? And the ground stone tools, all of that, that suggests that people are coming back to this place um, to dwell seasonally, probably. Um, and that makes good sense to me. So now just concluding on some of those and uh, some of my kind of wild hair ideas. Do people have questions so far? Am I everybody's tracking more or less? Okay, good enough, good enough. So yeah, through the middle archaic, um, Hell's Midden shows high sedentism. The trouble with that is what the hell does sedentism mean? I don't know, I can't tell you, but it could be that they were occupying the site very frequently. It could be that when they occupied the site, they stayed there for a long time. Or it could be also they came to this site and had a ton of people on that site uh, dwelling there all at once. All of those things would give us basically the same picture that we're left with today. So teasing that out uh, would require some more, uh, some more data. But the scrapers and alls at these sites, uh, that suggests they were being used in the winter months, right? This is the record 
if you look at this stuff ecologically, um, big game species in this region, migratory big game species, elk and deer, this is exactly what they're doing. In the winter, they move to the river lowland where there's a lot of plant food, much warmer temperatures. It's a way better place to hang out. And I hope this isn't news to anybody, but you all are migratory big game species. And so it kind of makes sense that we would be doing that same thing. And then, you know, larger groups would be aggregating in these river bottoms. And in the summer months, those groups would split apart probably into smaller bands, smaller hunting groups um, and disperse, right? Again, the historic accounts of Shoshone folks using the rivers in this way and, um, Particularly north of the Yampa River, you see a lot of heavy plant processing um, being done in the winter and fall during the Archaic Era. So this really fits in really nicely to that data. Um, so the Fremont occupations, man, when they move in, I mean, corn farming, that's a different kind of thing. You really you probably want to watch your fields, particularly when you have just such large population across the broader landscape, right? Your tribe or your uh, familial group or however it was broken up back then, you know, you might have been actually kind of pressed and forced to stay in these areas because other river canyons were just equally as occupied. It was very difficult to move around. They didn't have the same kind of freedom of movement um, of earlier periods. Right. What we don't see that I mentioned is that late archaic to early uh, agricultural transition. What was going on there? You know, it would be really nice to know if this was a group migrating in, if this was just technology migrating in, how exactly that happened. But it was totally a race. And I'll go back to the profile to show you how that happened here, because here's that the top of that lower sequence where the Fremont occupation start digging into these levels. So it's not hard to imagine how they could have erased a big portion of what was then the site surface, right? It could have been by clearing weeds off the, off the surface of the mid and all these things to make it more habitable. Um, okay, so now why aren't there caves? Why don't we have archaic deposits in these caves? And I have an idea. So now I'm gonna try to summarize all of this bring in my kind of wild hair ideas about neolithization and uh, persistent places and how these are formed. Because Hell's Midden clearly is a persistent place on the landscape. It's some place that was somehow held in social memory. People knew to go and revisit that place, right? Evidence for that is like the caches, right? If you are caching goods at a site, uh, caching these hand stones, perfectly usable as they are, but people are making the choice to leave these on the site, thinking, oh, you know, I'm going to be back here next year. I'm going to need some hand stones, so I'm going to cache those there, right? Other things like fire features or possibly occupation features that we can't see today, right? All of those things would have been investments into this site that makes it easier for future people to come and use this. I'll try to use a modern analogy. There's a ton of modern analogies for how site formation likes this work, like this works. But um, think about, for example, a two track across open prairie, right? The first time somebody takes their truck across that open prairie, they're putting a lot of risk to their tires, right? And maybe they'll hit a stump or something like this that would cause trouble for them. But if they made it okay, somebody who comes to that two track later, hey, I'm not gonna blaze myself a new track. This person already ran this. So I'm gonna go through here. Right, the construction of features, leaving of cash goods is a very similar process. Another personal example came up earlier this week. I went fishing in uh, Florence, and uh, obviously, them building the pond. Well, that encourages reuse of that site. Uh, but somebody had left; uh, they didn't clean up, right? And they left some uh, fruit smiles, little fruit snacks, on my uh, fishing pad. And I was getting ready to go before I found these. I thought, oh, there's fruit smiles here. Well, I'll eat these and I can keep fishing a little while longer. <laughs> so that's how even unintentionally, right, people being on a site and leaving their trash behind, that trash could be useful to people in the future. And it encourages reuse, 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 right? Um, 
more reuse encourages more reuse and so on and so forth. Other examples I have here, yeah, indigenous trail systems becoming our modern roadways. Cities like Tenochtitlan, you know, you go and conquer this place. You're not going to go to all the effort of building a whole new capital city. You think, man, they put a lot of work into this place. They already got the canals and all this. I guess we'll just move in here, right? Uh, or campsites, party sites in the woods, right? So that basically just goes over uh, what I was just saying. But one thing that's really interesting in the literature, when people talk about persistent places like this, and they talk about uh, hunter-gatherer folks caching, you know, I'm caching my uh, ground stones here so that I can come back. There's always this kind of unspoken um, assumption that when people are caching at a site like Hell's Midden, they're caching for their own private use. They're saying, I'm leaving this here so that when my family returns, I'm going to be able to reuse this stuff. I don't think that's supported at all, because why would you be choosing such prominent locations on the landscape to be leaving your stuff behind? It seems more like it's not conceived of in private terms. Are people tracking what I'm saying? That it wasn't just you leaving that for your family in the future. It's I'm going to leave this here because then anybody who comes by in the future will have an, any, an easier time. Right. The fruit smiles. That was unintentional. Nobody thought I'm going to leave this here. So when I come back tomorrow, I'll have old sun beaten fruit snacks. You know? <laughs> but it made it a more habitable spot for me is all I'm trying to say. So reuse, incentivize, reuse, incentivize, reuse. But then Fremont folks come along. And what's the deal? They slip into this stream of reuse. Hey, this Castle Park site is sweet. Hey, man, there's all kinds of old, you know, spear points lying around. We can refashion these into arrow points. Or there's all these kind of fire features. Hey, let's just blow out the ash and start our own fire here. All these people have put so much work. Gosh, it makes us easier for us uh, Fremont people. But you start to see another thing with these agricultural societies, particularly the Fremont uh, kind of they rise up on this landscape. You see totally new regimes of land use. Part of that is really uh, intense evidence for territoriality. Right? You see this in granaries. Can anybody spot the granary in this photo? There is one. It's really, really tricky. Right here. Way up on this cliff wall. Right. Well, that's not stopping a pack rat from getting that. But that does make it really hard for a human from the next village over to come and raid your stores. And if you see him climbing up that cliff wall, you know, one arrow to the back will dispatch him. Right? You see other stuff. In certain villages, you begin to see granaries actually moving from public spaces to private homes. You see homes being constructed with apparently unused wings that people have theorized were just to make a grander, larger kind of uh, house within this village that could have been occupied by somebody who held a role of prestige of some kind in that society. The rock art, we have, uh, John's got it on the back of his shirt, the McConkie Ranch rock art, this vernal style Fremont rock art, shows dudes with you know, headhunters holding the he severed heads of other folks, lots of violence and things like this, right? And you also see cave caches. Here's an example of some of that prestigious rock art. This is from Sago Canyon. These have been interpreted as actually, these individuals could come back and add tally marks to their jewelry here as maybe some kind of war honor or something like that. Of course, that's all somewhat speculative, but you definitely see this prestige machismo kind of thing rising up in Fremont society at that time. So my questioning is, do we not have these caches within caves pre-Fremont because the Fremont brought this idea of a private good, right? By taking the caches and moving them from real prominent, easy to access spots along the river like Hell's Midden, you can access it from Hell's Canyon, coming from either side of the Yampa River, it's right there, right? The Fremont come in and all of their caching moves into these cave sites, right? Is this a way of Fremont folks in the bottoms controlling access to who gets to those caches, who's able to access this religious paraphernalia, however you want to think of this really obviously elaborate 
kind of materials that are left in these caves, right? And so do the Fremont and their kind of Neolithic, you know, uh, agricultural, all these ideas, the establishment of hierarchy in society, are they trying to control access to some of their materials by stashing it away in the caves that hadn't um, happened in previous times? That is basically my talk, y'all. I want to give uh, thanks to all the people who funded my research, uh, uh, CAS and the CCPA, uh, Loveland Archaeological Society. I want to thank my family for being here and all of you all for being here. It's just such a kick seeing everybody. And uh, yeah, I hope that was good. Nice. Happy to answer questions if folks have questions, I imagine. Midden. Yep. Okay. Okay, the question is, uh, what is a midden, right? The site, Hell's Midden. And this was something I just mentioned in passing at the very beginning of the uh, talk. But a midden is just a trash deposit. And so a lot of times you see these under big village sites, particularly in the Southwest, where you have the village kind of inside this cave, and then you have a big dump of refuse spilling out from there, right? When they first saw this site, I mean, just the way it looks on the landscape, they saw it and thought it was a midden. As I've kind of, I, I hope, demonstrated somewhat, it was a primary occupation surface, not a midden, but I'm stuck with the name. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds better than 5MF16, in my opinion. <laughs> so I hope that answered it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if they're snare slides or not, might be debatable. Some of them we have on snares, but it's basically a piece of bird bone, or any kind of bone, typically bird bone, cut into a tube. It's incised along one end. And so they would have had... Um, cordage that ran through that slip and tied back to it. And so it's basically the piece that's, yeah, reducing friction on the cord and just letting that bone slide and catching any poor hapless little critters. You know? <laughs> yes, Sylvia. Million dollar question there, Sylvia. She said, uh, can you tell if the archaic people were ancestral to the Fremont? And that's really the enigma of the Fremont is that we don't know where they came from and we don't know where they went. And the tribes out there do not claim them for the most part, which to me, I think is kind of, I think that might be evidence for some of this machismo, real jerkish kind of hierarchical behavior. Forget those Fremont dudes. <laughs> Yes. Uh huh. Survival of DNA. Uh, you could potentially do studies of the soil. There's no human remains from this site. Could potentially, but the way that the uh, kind of political climate is, you know, you wouldn't really. Uh, go after that. I mean, the indigenous folks uh, just aren't really interested in those kind of questions. And so typically we wouldn't be, yeah, kind of looking at that. Okay. Uh, yes, you do see Puebloan stuff, black on white pottery. Uh, oh, sorry. The question was um, uh, any evidence of Fremont trading with other contemporary groups? And um, you do see that you definitely see within Fremont uh, culture tra in trading amongst them. And so a lot of ink's been spilled on kind of Fremont trade fairs that could have happened uh, certain times of year where they were trading ceramics from certain production centers and then spreading those across the whole Fremont range. Um, but yes, there is evidence of some of that. Uh -huh. Yes. Consultant or anybody along the way, a geomorphologist, this the there? No. It just seems like a, a strictly anthropogenic. Right. How much you've got above your major pre-lot exit? 
this 50 centimeters up top. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. No, it is very bizarre. Yeah. No, uh, the question was, has a geomorphologist looked at this, these strata, uh, or this strata, stratigraphic sequence here? The answer is no. In one season, they did. I don't know offhand which, but yes, they did. And certainly down below, you've got sand and silt layers. Yes, right. Yes. And right here below, that's like that 350 centimeter mark I was talking. Below that, it definitely seems to be a lot of non cultural levels. Um, yeah, but it's confusing too because these are all jumbled up. Yes, there's one. Let me see. There's one. No, no. And it's from that. Oh, that was the slide. Yeah, this right here, 547 is the median calibrated there, AD. And that's kind of out of sequence because that is within this level that's otherwise 1000 AD. Um, yeah. And the issue is we don't have horizontal provenience on hardly any of this stuff. So beyond the distinction between 49 and 48, I don't know how far north, you know, how far out of the midden or of the shelter it was, these things were taken yeah. from. Mm -hmm. that kind of yeah, right. And clear, this is the highest portion of the midden. Um, I don't have like a full topo of the entire thing, but this here, it definitely seems like there's some funneling from that upper surface that's just depositing a ton of stuff there. Particularly since you have all this uh, uh, newspaper from this Pat Lynch horizon, you know, even though that was just the 1880s, seems like, man, that would have had to get covered up pretty quick for newspaper to just be sitting ex more or less exposed. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Not really. And I think, I mean, I think part of it is that when folks did eventually reoccupy something I would guess jumbled it up as them pulling all the veg off the surface. They're just these huge sagebrush that the archaeologists, when they were living on the site, you know, had to rip up. So surely people before them did too. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yes, John. Um, the only really nearby one is a Delu shelter is another one to look at. Uh, oh, and sorry, the question was, do the strata here uh, mirror any other sites in the area? Um, and they're pretty rare. Uh, uh, Delu shelter, which is just the other side of the state line with Utah and dinosaur, looks very similar. Slightly older. There's a hell gap component there, so a late paleo component at the very bottom. Uh, but like this site, their late archaic early formative transition is removed. There's not, there's that whole sequence from 1000 BC to 1000 AD is basically missing. So similar in that way. Yeah. Uh, Doug asked, are there plans to go back and dig? Uh, the site is actually on private land. It was, it was the Mantles Ranch, which some of y'all might have remembered big fights with the federal government to hold that land because it's totally encircled by Dinosaur National Monument. Uh, it recently sold for like $14 million or something insane. Um, uh, so, no, I'd like to. Um, yeah, I'd like to. Yeah. I haven't made contact. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Kate. Okay. Slide 28. Uh, didn't know, but that's there this one. Is it this one? Oh, this one. Okay, yeah. So I didn't really use this as a reference, but this was just when I was talking about how, you know, people investing in a site makes it really favorable for later people to come. Here, you can see this cactus flat area. Whoever this 
person was that originally cleared the cactus from that well dang that makes that look you know 20 times better than any other plot of land next to it so i was just trying to show there that um that cleared area would have been a small investment someone made that made it easier for later folks uh this is oh the city oh you're asking uh, uh this is yes mexico city exactly yes uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, and that's the that's the real that's another real sticker. You guys are asking good questions. Uh, I just talked about it as sedentism because I didn't really want to get into the weeds, but like I say, I mean, the record that we're seeing could be from a short stay by a ton of people or a lengthier stay by much fewer people, right? It's really tough to know. Um, I don't know. Uh, similar Fremont villages. This doesn't, Castle Park doesn't really look like a Fremont village per se, but you know, upwards of uh, getting to 100 people, something like that would be a pretty typical size for the archaic period. Psh, no idea. I have to make a comment about that. That's one of my bugaboos. You know, that little trenches that they actually exactly. Yes, 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 yes. So Mike's comment was just that all we know from this site is that one trench. And that was where I was showing in that one slide. If all I had was one of those years versus the other, my interpretation would be radically different. Um, so it's really important to, yeah, stay humble about that. Memento mori, yes. Yep, yep. For this region, there was some fluctuation in precipitation, uh, uh, kind of the general trend you see. But as far as available species and things like that, it doesn't look like it changed enough to affect those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. now, the question was, is the environment the same? I don't know if I said that. <laughs> you just mentioned about the trenches. So if you could, if you could dig another trench 10 feet either direction mm. of the current trenches, then you can compare what you find in those trenches versus what you got from the other. Right. And that's something that you're not able to do because you can't get permission. Oh, uh, but it would just be a longer term thing. I mean, I just had to keep it discreet so I could get out of grad school. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, the question was, if you went back in the future, would you hit other areas of the site? And I think yes. And there's some sites, I mean, this trenching method of digging one trench straight through and then one kind of perpendicular against the shelter wall was very common in that day. The first thing you'd have to sort out though is how has that thing changed since? Because that two meter by 10 meter uh, by five meter exposed trench was never backfilled. So that site has surely now slumped all those things jumbled in together. There's cool work done in caves in Texas, like the Eagle Rock Shelter, where they're able to go in and with really fine stratigraphy, retrace how that stuff has been affected since earlier excavations. That's what I would wanna do, is to go back to the levels that they were actually seeing and get finer vertical resolution on them and horizontal resolution, yeah. This area was just crummy. I didn't really mention that. Most of these levels were dug in 30 centimeter levels, which is, Freaking huge. I mean, that's a lot uh, to be grouping into one thing. Yes, Catherine. Yes. Yes, it was. Um, and they did not find any evidence of that village they thought would be up there. Um, there's no soil. I mean, and that's kind of the character of this entire region is that the uplands just have absolutely no soil. They're entirely an erosional environment. The river bottoms is entirely depositional. So the only place that, uh, you know, buried strata like that could exist would be in those river bottoms. Up top, was there a village? Who knows? They didn't find it. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, you all back home. Okay.